Let's welcome in our next guest, the state director for uh, Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia branch, Jason Huffman. Jason, good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. How are you all for Awesome, man. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. It's great to have you along for the ride. All right. We are one week away from the end of the legislative session Saturday. At some point, it should come to a close. We talked with Delegate Chuck Hurst this morning. He seems to think that everything is going to go the way it has been since Republicans took over. A budget will roll out on time. Uh, This uh, tax cut that has gone through the House and the Senate is expected to be signed by the governor. And we move forward. They've got, uh, looks like, their solutions for the solvency of PEIA and DHHR has uh, been restructured, and they've got their plan for that, too. So looking at those three accomplishments, Jason, would you say this has been a successful session to this point, barring an unforeseen disaster in the last week? Well, you can never tell what's going to happen in the last week of legislative session. I'll I'll preface by saying that. But uh, I I think it's a real promises made, promises kept moment for lawmakers, right, particularly when it comes to um, the reduction in taxes. I mean, that bill is on its way to Governor Justice uh, for his signature, uh, the little doubt that he's going to sign it, since that has been a major objective for him for the last couple of years. And frankly, it, it's it's been a, a milestone, a moment for lawmakers um, since they took the majority back in, in 2014, right? They've been talking about, uh, Republicans have been talking about cutting taxes now for basically a decade. And here we are in a moment where, uh, you know, just to put this in perspective for folks, the, the plan, the compromise tax plan, um, will cut the income tax by 20%, uh, and will basically do a car rebate and some other things. But that's over, well over half a billion dollars back into the pockets of hardworking West Virginians so that they can better invest in their lives and livelihoods. So it's a big deal. Bill? Yeah. Uh, so uh, is there anything that you did not get done that you were hoping would pass this year, Jason? Uh, to, to be quite frank, that was our, our number one objective, was the tax cut, right? Mm-hmm. And I think uh, when it comes to, you know, we're a very grassroots-driven organization. I think over 10,000 West Virginians uh, reached out to their lawmakers to, to ask them uh, to reduce taxes. And so I think uh, with that kind of a grassroots movement occurring, we, we call that a, a pretty big win. Okay. Would you extend the grassroots uh, movement to PEIA as well? Well, I think that, you know, and as lawmakers, and I listened to the debate Saturday when they passed the bill in the House, um, you know, that's such a sticky wicket because they do have to do something to shore that system up. Um, And there was a lot of conjecture as to what that should be. Uh, I think we didn't take a position on that particular legislation. However, I think it was a responsible move by lawmakers um, to do what they did. You know, in the private sector, uh, premiums have gone up. Over the last 10 years, PEIA has not seen a premium increase in that same time. Um, I think really what we have to do is is perhaps ask ourselves if if government should be in the business of ensuring people's health care. Yeah, a legitimate question. Um, That's a a think tank question. That's a think tank question. But the fact that the government has committed to uh, to provide an insurance to its to its employees, that the government has an obligation, Uh, and. As we discussed earlier today, uh, everybody acknowledges something had to be done, uh, and they took some positive steps. Uh, I will be, and it will sort out in time. Uh, is there going to be a population or subpopulation that is carrying a heavier burden? Uh, initially, some people. Some of the teachers think they are carrying a heavier burden, a combination of the spousal uh, buy-in and, um, uh, and the increase in premiums. Uh, but I guess that's going to have to be uh, uh, sorted out in time. you have any sense at all, uh, because you, you do say you're a grassroot, and by definition of grassroot, you have your finger on the pulse. Uh, do you have any sense at all about the reaction to some of these groups to the PA with, with the changes suggested or made? Well, certainly, I think that um, there has been, obviously, you know, per the, the press conference, AFL-CIO and other folks have criticized this. The teachers' unions have, have criticized the move, and, and they put some math out there basically trying to illustrate what the increase in cost would be. But one of the things they left out of their mathematic equation uh, that they, you know, purported to lawmakers uh, was a tax cut. Uh, I think that, you know, when you're, when you're making a move that's going to put money back into the pockets of every 
working West Virginian, it's pretty hard not to take that into account. Uh, I thought that was a little bit disingenuous, but I, I think genuinely um, over the course of the last couple of years, there's been a growing disconnect between perhaps leaders of, of organized labor and, and rank and file folks. Um, I think that the vast majority of West Virginians understand that health care costs are going up um, and that necessitates, at least in PEIA, a premium increase, right? And so it's, I think, you know, Dr. Rohrbach, Delegate Rohrbach, the uh, the deputy speaker, said it best. Nobody wanted to vote on that bill. Nobody wanted to have that bill before them because um, they know that they're inflicting some pain on, on public employees. However, uh, the, the, the trade-off was essentially we either do something to stabilize this system or nobody's going to have insurance. Uh, And that was a a tough pill to swallow, but one that was necessary. And you made a very valid point a couple minutes ago that we and I, I put myself in the category of not reminding myself uh, the the way the tax cut is going to play into this. Uh, And a 22 uh, percent tax cut will obviously uh, add more money into the pocket. So we we tend to look at those aspects that and the property tax rebate on the and the property tax as well. That's right. So yeah, if you look at the total picture, it's less of a less of a uh, financial burden than some folks would suggest it might be. Yeah, I, I think you know, by and large, lawmakers gave more than they got. Right. I mean, when when you look at the tax cut, you look at. Uh, I know that there's a there's a pay raise being discussed that would help to offset the the cost of the PEIA premium increases. I mean, you get, you can't knock them for not trying, right? And one of the big things that I think, uh, particularly those in organized labor that were that were critical of cutting taxes, uh, neglected to to think about uh, is that that bill uh, will eventually phase the income tax out as as we continue to have uh, revenue growth and economic growth in the state, uh, which is certainly you know helped by by reducing tax rates um you'll see the income tax go down by by a total of potentially 10 percent every year that we have a surplus and so what we're talking about is a a long-term trajectory that gets west virginians rates down without further legislative action um and i i do find it kind of curious that an organization that uh purports to represent workers doesn't want them to keep more of their hard-earned money, but that's uh, perhaps neither here nor there. You say uh, a continuation of a you used 10% tax cut without legislative action. I'm confused because there's no triggers that would do an automatic reduction of 10%. So you've got to have legislative action, I think, to for father uh, uh, decreases. I thought I read that there were triggers in the final bill. Were there bill. triggers? I, I missed that if there was. Jason? Be the tiebreaker. Yes, sir. Yes, there, uh, there, there are triggers in there, um, oh. and I think they're fairly responsibly crafted. Um, what it does is looks at you know the overall revenue surplus minus a, a base year, uh, 2019 fiscal year of uh, severance taxes, and, and subtract that number, and, and eventually you come to a, a formulaic approach to say, hey, we think that we have enough as government, and now we need to give more back to the people, and, and to have that in law um, without further legislative action needed. So it, it really puts us in a situation as a state where basically you're not seeing, you know, government coffers swell beyond what, you know, it, they should be. And in, instead, uh, we're, we're automatically giving dollars back to, to taxpayers. And we think that's uh, that's totally crucial for the state moving forward. Well, I stand corrected. I did not realize there are triggers involved. That's, that's good. So There are, and I don't know, how many there are, and I don't even remember which state it was. I was just reading an article in Kiplinger's magazine about tax-friendly states, and it was talking about certain states that have triggers, but they work in either direction. So when times are good, it triggers the state income tax rate to go lower, and when times aren't, it can tick up a little bit higher to make up for the difference there. I don't think there's a mechanism in here that ticks back up, though, automatically, Jason, correct? It's just one way, and that's down if it's possible. That is correct. Yeah, the, the triggers in West Virginia, as, as uh, are in the bill now, um, they they only go one way, and that's that's further reductions. Um, I think, you know, it, it'd be another thing um, <laughs> if potentially we had triggers in there that would increase taxes. But that's uh, that's not something that this bill does. Almost like a constant yield rate that they do for property taxes in in some yeah. communities, right? So, uh, as this then these triggers are built into the law is there an expiration date on this law for when these triggers might go away or do they continue until the rate ultimately goes to zero 
uh, they are in there into perpetuity. And so basically um, they're, they're on the books. They'll continue to be on the books. Now that doesn't mean that we potentially uh, don't need to go back in and, and, you know, tweak a little bit to, to make sure that the triggers are functioning as, as they're intended to. Um, but generally speaking, I think they're, they're fairly solidly constructed, well thought out. Again, lawmakers are being fiscally responsible sort of like what they have done over the last, you know, five or six years, which is make government live within its means just like families have to, um, and, and be stewards of taxpayer dollars, which, uh, you know, having flatline budgets and, and really paying attention to what government is, is funding as a genuine priority has, has put us in a position where we could give money back to folks because, uh, because the economy has grown. And none of this stuff happens in a, in a vacuum, right? Policy decisions that are made um, – oftentimes are, are very interconnected. You know, you've seen all kinds of pro-growth policies that, that the legislature has enacted. And, you know, we're at a time when uh, you're starting to see that bear fruit. And it's a really exciting thing for the state. When Delegate Householder, then House Finance Chairman Householder, initially proposed a system of gradual state income tax cuts that worked on a trigger, he also had a set aside of a certain amount of money that would be put away to cover shortfalls or whatever, just in case. Is, is there any type of safety system involved with this legislation that you're aware of? No, I think uh, because they, you know, the compromise plan is a lot lower of an initial rate reduction uh, as as the one that was originally passed by the House. You know, that was 50 percent. Uh, this one only cuts the uh, income tax a total of a 21.25 percent in the first year. Uh, I think the the previous bill was something like thirty percent in the first year and ten and ten the the following two years. So uh, basically, I I think uh, they didn't feel like they they needed that. They felt they felt like maybe the uh, the revenues that they have in terms of the general revenue budget, et cetera, were were going to be in a position to to cover any potential shortfall. But I I, I frankly don't anticipate there being um, a shortfall. Right. What we're talking about is over half a billion dollars back into the pockets of West Virginians. And I think that is going to bring growth to the state. That's going to bring people to the state. Further rate reductions are going to increase both of those things. I mean, states that do not levy an income tax uh, grow at double the rate in terms of population as states that do. And so the closer we can get to uh, being in competition with these other states, because we just haven't been for a long time. Um, you know, we had the 17th highest top marginal rate in the country, the, the 14th highest second marginal rate in the country. And, uh, you know, we needed to act on that because other states uh, were lowering rates and, and making us even even more out of competition uh, with those with those other states. Yeah, I was picking up on what Rob said about this cushion, this insurance policy. Uh, when uh, uh, Eric Tarr was talking to us uh, a couple of weeks ago, he was saying a $600 million cushion, and yet his tax uh, reduction was only 15%. Uh, but you do not think the $600 million, anything comparable to it, was carried over the uh, after the compromise? Well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think if you, you have to take all the pieces the bill in total, right? I mean, the, the income tax cut, I think, is somewhere around $650 million. But the total tax cut, including, you know, the rebates on cars, uh, there's a, a tax credit for uh, disabled veterans' homesteads. Um, you know, there's a there's a tax credit, 50%, for, um, you know, companies that are valued, you know, property value less than a million dollars on their, on their um, inventory. And so I, they're the total tax cut is more around $750, $800 million. Um, but as we've, as we've talked before, you know, our, our organization doesn't particularly think that, that rebate schemes work very well. Um, and so I, it's, it's unclear to me whether those will live up to the fiscal note that's attached to them, right? Because there's a lot of um, – anytime you make taxpayers jump through a hoop to get a rebate, uh, it's, it's something that is uh, not – particularly tenable. Folks like predictability. Um, they, they, they don't like the paperwork, frankly. And so, you know, the, the biggest the biggest bet in this package is, is the income tax cut because, you, you know, you don't have to. It's just not coming out of your paycheck anymore. Yeah, I realize your organization was primarily focused on the, uh, the tax cut. Uh, did you follow the DHHR discussion very much? Uh, no, we, we actually did not. Okay. 
Jason Huffman, our guest here, State Director, West Virginians, uh, Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia chapter here. Uh, Jason, compare West Virginia now with this new tax plan to its surrounding states in terms of attractiveness. Uh, I think it's um, it's a little difficult to quantify, right? I mean, the rates have reduced and, and, and made it a little bit more competitive. Uh, I think that the the continuation of rate reductions is going to greatly aid us in, in that particular statistical category. Um, but remember that other states are continuing to lower their, lower their rates, right? And so I think the initial tax cut is uh, it's a good first step, right? It's one of those things that we look at and say, hey, you know, lawmakers have been trying to pass something like this um, for, you know, the better part of 10 years, right? And so uh, to be able to finally get something on the books is important. Um, and, you know, again, this, this puts in a framework uh, for continued work on this. I, I would anticipate at some point in time, um, you know, lawmakers will want to, to take another look at taxation in the state, perhaps not too long from now, right? And so um, having the framework in place is important. Again, historic tax cut, a, a true milestone for, for lawmakers. Um, and, you know, I'd be remiss without, without thanking uh, Majority Leader Householder and uh, Governor Justice. And, and Senate President Craig Blair for their hard work on on coming together to get this done because uh, <laughs> I, I think that there was a, a definitely a permutation of reality where we didn't get anything done and and those folks rolled up their sleeves and and came together to to do something that was truly historic for the state and the movement on it was pretty quick too we went from doing interviews where people were pessimistic and I'm talking about interviews with elected officials in Charleston their delegates and and senators where people were pretty pessimistic about anything getting done to all of a sudden it turned over to this is going to get done before the end of the session. It's going to get done rather quickly. The movement was, yeah, was quick. I, I, well, I think there was, there was a lot of, again, I know, I know for a fact that, you know, over 10,000 West Virginians had, had reached out to their lawmakers and, um, you know, Republicans were sent a super duper majority by voters and I think they're cognizant of the, the sort of mandate that, that that comes with, right? Like voters in West Virginia have said, you know, let's not tinker around with the margins. Let's, let's do bold reforms that transform the state in a meaningful way. Uh, and I think that any time you have that much grassroots um, emboldening of legislators, uh, it, it, it's helpful for the policy process. But again, like you said, it was, uh, I think, uh, it had the potential to to not manifest itself, right? There were was a difference of opinions, and I think it, it took folks um, deciding that hey, we have a, a an opportunity here to do something that is truly transformational for West Virginia. Let's let's put the priority before our you know perhaps personalities in some instances, but in others, uh, I mean the legislative process is just a, a tough one, right? I mean. Uh, it's set up to to not have rapid changes happen uh, very quickly uh, by design. You know, the deliberative process of the legislature is a slow one, and so um, again, it's uh, it uh, kudos to those folks for for seeing it through to the end. There was some pessimism. You're exactly right, Rob. But in every one of them, there was a caveat. And the caveat was, we all want to get something done. And I think they were working toward that because everybody wanted to get something done. They just had to decide which was the best path to take. I think the movement on this really came with the House deciding to accept Senate President Blair's insistence that there be some type of amendment to work around. Jason, and that is the rebate on the personal property tax for automobiles, because in the interviews we we did with Craig Blair, Eric Tarr, they were insistent that there was a campaign full of misinformation that persuaded voters to not vote for Amendment 2, and they wanted to right that perceived wrong by making sure there was some type of workaround for Amendment 2. And in the early interviews we did with members of the House of Delegates, they all said Amendment 2 is dead. People voted on it. It's gone. It's not going to be a part of this tax cut. So their ability to compromise on that, I think, was the key to getting this legislation through because the Senate wasn't going to budge. Well, and uh, you know, the, the Senate's heart is in the right place. I mean, we're one of eight states that has an inventory tax. I mean, we know it's a job killer. Uh, we know that the tax on business machinery and equipment, uh, you know, discourages investment in the state. And 
Uh, it's unfortunate that Amendment 2 didn't pass because then we could have taken, you know, substantive action to actually eliminate those rates or bring those rates down. Um, you know, I, I think wanting to the desire to have a, a rebate sort of system, um, it's, it, they're, they're doing the best with what they can do constitutionally um, to bring some of those rates down. And so, you know, again, Hearts in the right place, um, and I think at the end of the day, it all it all worked out uh, for the betterment of the state, combined with you know the, the income tax cut stuff. So, um, I think I would imagine eventually we're going to have another debate over you know we're going to rehash Amendment Two at some point in time, and you know in full disclosure, we we supported Amendment Two. Uh, we went out and knocked all kinds of doors all over the state to talk to voters about it. Uh, you know, it did not it did not work out like we wanted it to uh, in this previous election. But, you know, I think you, you have uh, a genuine desire of policymakers to want to be able to have the constitutional authority, which they should have um, to adjust those tax rates. Um, and the fact that they're located in the Constitution currently is uh, is kind of a, a, a curious instance. There are states across the nation that are looking at these same rates and trying to figure out the best way to eliminate them. And we're really hamstrung in West Virginia because uh, because they can't meaningfully do that constitutionally without changing the, the Constitution. I think you answered my next question, which was, with income tax reform underway, what's next as a focus for Americans for prosperity? But I think you answered it when you talked about Amendment 2 right there and revisiting that. Well, certainly, and I think you know there there are several other things that lawmakers have uh, have worked on this session. And as always, you know we'll have our scorecard that comes out, and, and we intend to um, go out and, and thank members who were you know pivotal players on on getting the the tax cut done. Uh, as always, we're we're there to uh, to educate folks and, and really engage people in the policy process. That's that's bread and butter for what we do from a day to day is is connect with people in West Virginia and get them reengaged in the policy process. Because I'll tell you what, and I use this uh, whenever we go and speak different places, um, if you have five people in a congressional district, call their member of Congress's office with an issue. Just five people, it begins casework on that issue. Now, if you extrapolate that down to the, the state legislative level, um, people's voices matter a great deal, and, and everybody, I think, sometimes forgets that the government works for the people and not the other way around. And so we, we like to have that general reminder out there that, uh, that you know, the more the grassroots is engaged in the policy process, I think the, the better we, we have an end result when it comes to policymaking. Bill, do you have a final question for Jason? I do not. Thanks, Jason, for joining us. Jason, good to yeah, talk with you, you man. All. Have a good day, buddy. Have, you too. Thanks. Jason Upman, State Director for Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia.